Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Country Music Made Me. Thank you so much for joining us once again. As always, please be sure to like, share, follow, subscribe to us wherever you are listening. You can leave us a review, a rating, tell your friends, your family, your neighbors to come on over and have a listen. That support is huge. Today, we are joined by Lily Rose. Now, after 10 plus years of chasing a career in music, things really started to ramp up at the end of 2020. She posted a clip of her song, Villain, on TikTok, and it went viral. In 2021, she has signed a record deal. She has released her debut EP, and she is living the dream that she has been chasing ever since jumping on the drums at the age of nine. So please enjoy our conversation with Lily Rose. I've never been to Canada. No, nope. never been. How close have you been? How close to the border? Uh, North Dakota. I've been to my my fiance's family. Uh, a couple of them live there, so I've been to all the cities in North Dakota. But that's about as close as it gets. That's awesome, and you say fiance. Congratulations on the engagement. Thank you. It's still so weird. It's one of those things that's not natural yet. You know, it's, it's wild. And you guys met just about three years ago, I believe. Talk about that moment. Did you, was it pretty quick that you knew your life was changing at that moment when you met? Yeah, we met in September of 2018. Um, and it was actually here in Nashville, um, on a, a work trip kind of thing for the company she worked for. She was in Nashville and I was just here you know, unpacking boxes overnight at American Eagle. And that's how we met. And then we did long distance for about a year and a half until she moved to Nashville a um, week before the tornado. And then a week after that was COVID. So it was like, you know, we did a long distance for a year and a half. And then all of a sudden we were quarantined together. And um, I think that just solidified that we were meant to be. <laughs> that is awesome. And has planning begun for the wedding or is it still too new to start thinking about the plans quite yet? Well, you know, I do have quite a busy schedule, so we tried to nail down a date sooner rather than later. So we are in the process of of planning already, which is insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. So on Country Music Made Me, I love to take the journey of music throughout life and find out from the earliest points how that has guided you to where you are today. And so I want to start as a kid, I noticed in the overnight sensation video, there's a lot of clips of bedroom and living room performances when you were young. And so when did those start for you jumping up in front of the family and just bouncing around and performing? Yeah, you know, I've never really thought about it this way, but um, I was never that kid that was like, needs to be the center of attention and the look at me, look at me, I want to perform. I was an athlete. So I think I was comfortable with people having their eyes on me. But it was mainly a competitive thing within myself of like, I have to learn this song so I can play it for everybody kind of thing. And uh, yeah, growing up, it was just, my parents always had music on in the house. So it was very natural of after dinner, hey, mom and dad, I'm going to play you two of the songs I learned on the piano or song I, on the guitar or the drums, whatever it was. And I'm just still so thankful that my parents were patient with me and took the time to sit there and uh, listen to my horrible piano playing <laughs> <laughs> and did the piano come before the drums you know um I think it was all pretty simultaneous I kind of forgot that I played the piano back then until I saw those clips for the overnight sensation video um which is wild because I've always said drums first but I always had a little like 44 key keyboard in my room growing okay. up so I think it was pretty simultaneous and then guitar was shortly after that so crazy. And so when you started the drums and the piano, were you like, did you know what music was or was it just kind of fooling around? And like you say, it was on in the house. So it was a cool thing to do. Or did you really have an understanding of it within yourself that maybe it was something that would be cool to do? Yeah. You know, I think I was able to grasp it pretty early on. Um, I remember having a moment with my dad when I was like five years old and I said, there was a song on the radio. Um, you only get what you give by the new radicals. Right. Yeah. You know, this is 1999 <laughs> hell of a song. And uh, I said, I like this song. And he turned to me and he said, I like this song too. And it was that first moment that we shared of liking a song together. It wasn't my kids songs. It wasn't dad's music. It was like, yo, we both like this. And I always had a grasp of it pretty early on, I think because of the amount of exposure that I had from my parents playing it. 
but they took me to my first Bruce Springsteen concert when I was nine years old. So like I had a grasp of what levels of music there were of like songs on the radio versus live. I think a little bit more than a kid that age would know. But um, I do remember, you know, you'd start playing recorder here in the States. That's the first thing you play when you're like the third grade. Right. And I just remember kind of looking around being like, I'm catching on to this a lot quicker than everybody else. And I think that was my first inkling of like, oh, okay. I think I've probably got a little something here. And at nine, I believe it was, is when you got your drums. Now, what was it about the drums that you were kind of pulled to that first? Um, you know, unless you're like a kid, that's like a phenom, you know, or like a Charlie Puth or something where you can just, you just go, go, go. (laughs) The first thing that's really visible, I think within kids is rhythm. And my parents saw that of, you know, whether it's tapping or whistling or whatever it was, they noticed that I had the rhythm. So when I expressed my interest in drums, they were like, yeah, you clearly have the rhythm to go with it. So, um, we'll, we'll take the chance on this. And, uh, obviously rhythm you need it for every instrument but I think that was the first thing in my mind I was like hell yeah I can do this let's go (laughs) that's awesome and I believe one of the people that sort of taught you the drums was your cousin Zach now you lost him tragically at the age of 21 and I just wanted to sort of celebrate him and, and have you talk about what he meant early on and throughout your journey in those early years yeah, first of all, thank you. And nobody's ever brought that up before. And it's something that's really important to me. Um, you know, I only, I don't have a huge family when it comes to cousins and aunts and uncles and stuff. So my aunt, Robin, who's my dad's sister, um, and my cousin Zach lived in Atlanta. So they were the only cousins and family that we had that we would do Thanksgiving, and Christmas, holidays, birthdays with. So I spent a lot of time with Zach. He was like my older brother. And he was just so talented on all of the instruments, the way that um, I always hope somebody would describe me to be of just self-taught. We're not like a a John Mayer by any means, but just can really handle our own across all the instruments. And it was always just so intriguing. And um, he really could have not let me touch his drum set and touch this and touch that as an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old when he's 12, 13. And he always did. And he always had a lot of patience with me. for a guy that didn't have a whole lot of patience. And I'm not sure if that was a, a universe thing or a God thing or what, um, that he really took the time with me. And looking back on it, I wish I had taken more time with my brother, even though he had no problems, he can play every instrument too. But uh, yeah, I think it was Zach's patience and just allowing me to even touch the instruments that really helped peak the musicianship interest, not just the music lover interest. Does it sometimes get so busy that, you sort of miss looking back on those big moments, like with Zach, like the Bruce Springsteen concert, those moments that happen that if they didn't happen, you likely wouldn't be where you are today. You know, I, I can't pride myself on a lot of things, but I will pride myself on really taking the time to be thankful and soaking up moments. Um, and I think the more that you live in the day and in the moment itself, the easier it is to remember it and not forget it down the line. And um, I think I've done a pretty good job with that in my career. I, I, from the day that I started playing drums at Zach's house, there's something of every year I can remember about my musical journey. And uh, I hope that continues because yes, now that it has gotten busier, it is very hard. It's a challenge for me to soak it all in, you know? So um, I'm, you reminded me heading into the new year soon that I got to keep doing that. I got to keep doing that. That is awesome. And talking about your career now, after high school, you sort of went into real life with the realization that music is something you wanted to do, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, you know, my whole life I was an athlete, um, really, really good, honestly, at basketball and soccer. And when high school came around, um, you know, different kids grow and speeds change and all of that. And I started realizing I'm probably not going to go play D one anywhere for those. Um, and I just was always that kid with the guitar around the campfire after our basketball tournaments, we'd all come back to my house and I'd sing like Katy Perry covers and Nicki Minaj guitar, acoustic guitar covers and stuff. And, um, 
I kind of describe myself senior year as kind of like a Troy Bolton from High School Musical, where I would like, I would play the talent show or the benefit show or whatever we were doing. And I'd go throw my basketball uniform on and go do it. Right. And that was the first time that I realized I was like, all right, I don't think sports is my future. I do think music could be. And um, at that time, I was still just a wide eyed kid. I didn't have any plans of Lily Rose or structuring anything or have a damn clue as to how to get there. But uh, I did know I was super inspired by Taylor Swift. We're the same age. So, you know, when she's 15 singing about being a freshman in the hallways, I was like, I'm a freshman in the hallways, you know, just, <laughs> just all up in your feels. Um, and then the show one tree Hill always, always was so much exposure of females being in the music industry. And I know I wanted it. And that's why I decided to go to school in Athens, Georgia, because it's not a music industry town, but it is a music city. And, um, and I love the Georgia Bulldogs with all my heart, but I really learned more there than I think I could have learned in a classroom about being an artist and being on stage and uh, just life, you know? Yeah. What did those years hold? Because did you go into the music industry more with a pop focus in mind when you first went into it? You know, um, I, ha- I always had the dreams that have not changed at all, which are to play and sell tickets for as many people and affect as many people with my songs as possible. But I don't think I ever really put a label on a genre within myself, um, which I probably was a detriment to exposure for a couple of different things over those years. But those five years really just were teaching me how to be on stage. I was not co-writing, so I was still in my own little bubble. So the songs were not very good, if I'm being honest. They were just not but I did learn after we, you know, we were playing 80 to hundred shows a year. Those last three years I was in Athens and I learned how to build a set list. I learned how to work a crowd. I learned how to, if your guitar cable stops working, how to play it cool on stage and all the things that right now we run into it. And I'm just kind of like, yeah, I've been here a hundred times. So I definitely got to a point where I realized that I needed to be in a music industry city. I feel like I had graduated from what I could learn in Athens and Nashville's always been the dream. Um, and I got up here. And at the time, my sound was kind of Ben Rector meets James Bay meets Keith Urban kind of thing. And uh, the second I started co-writing, I started falling in love with my own songs for the first time. And they just happened to be country. And I knew that I wanted to be a country songwriter, but I did not know for a fact I wanted to be a country artist until those songs were written. And uh, songs like Here For It and Greenlight and Better Than That and then Villain. Um, When we were writing those, I was like, oh, it's no question. I'm born to be in country music. Yeah. What was that like when you stepped into writer's rooms for the first time and started to co-write? Like, was it a nervous time or like you say, was it this whole new world opening up that just created excitement within you? Yeah. You know, for me, I didn't get like a publishing deal or anything until villain had already gone viral. So how the co-writing started for me was actually with people who I'd been friends with first. And then they were like, Hey, let's write together. And I was like, okay, like, I guess, like, I've never done this before. I've been, they all knew I was an artist and a songwriter, but I just never co-written. So, uh, my friend Forbes, my friend and producer, Matt Morrissey, uh, were two of the big ones that we just started co-writing all the time. So there was a level of comfort there. I've definitely been more nervous since the villain thing when I'm getting in the room with like Nicole Galleon and just Craig Wiseman, Roddy Clawson and all of these legends that I'm like, oh, okay, we're, we're doing this, all right, yeah. <laughs> you know? At the beginning of 2020, I believe it was, I saw that you posted on your social media, you said that you weren't trying to learn, you were trying to survive. And so talk about that time. That was probably around the 2018, 2019 point before Villain blew up. Talk about that time for you and what it was like personally. And like, was there ever a time of thinking like, this is it? I don't want to do this anymore. This is too difficult. Yeah. um, Those, you know, it was tough in Athens as we were touring and I was in college, but I was working so many jobs. I was making a bunch of money for a college kid and rent was cheap. And I got up here and I was like, I'm, I'm maybe over my head a little bit. And um, I was working a lot of overnight shifts and working 
easily 65 to 70 hours a week while also writing on top of that. And um, yeah, it was definitely a survival. It was more of a, how do I stay up here and afford to be up here, truly surviving and paying my rent to be in this city more than how do I crack the door into the industry? And um, the pandemic has brought so many new things to our world. Obviously, we're just in the craziest time, but TikTok, um, I put it off for longer than I'd like to admit um, because I just thought that it was for kids and dances and a little too cheesy for me. And how am I supposed to stay authentic and all of this? And then I saw my friends Priscilla and Andrew both get record deals from it. And I was like, they're not cheesy. They're just being themselves. I feel like I've got some good songs on here. And, um, you know, to this day, I still say to people, don't overlook what the real opportunity is. Yes, people might think the opportunity is getting that meeting with a record label so you can finally show them your songs. It's like, no, no, no. The opportunity is there's a free portal for you to download and make content to share with the world. Nobody's stopping you from that. You do not have control over a record label reaching out to you to take a meeting. You do have control over hitting that download button of whatever it is. It's TikTok right now. It was YouTube 10 years ago. It's like, whatever it is. But just like really zoom out and be like, what actually is in my control and what's not? And um, I had to do that because I did not want to get TikTok, if I'm being honest. And <laughs> thank God I did. I I would just, I could hug TikTok if it was an not an inanimate object. I just big old hug every morning. Before TikTok happened, you had mentioned that you were sort of navigating the world of your self-worth and having so much of your self-worth put into being a musician. And then 2020 hit and all of a sudden a musician can't be a musician anymore because you can't perform. And so talk about working through that and have you worked through that to tell yourself that you are more than just a musician. Yeah. You know, I, um, I'm definitely, I don't know if you guys are into the Enneagram up there. It's a, it's not a personality test per se, but it's a test that gives you a number that is all based off what you're afraid of. And for me, I'm an Enneagram three, which is the achiever or the entertainer hilariously enough. <laughs> and, uh, there's a lot of us here in town and there's really healthy versions of us and there's really unhealthy versions. And, I was always really turned off by the unhealthy threes in my life. And um, that is somebody that only puts their self-worth in their work and they put their self-worth in what other people think. And for me, I go to therapy. I do a lot of work to make sure that I am the best daughter, sister, fiance, cat mom, friend, before I'm the best artist, songwriter, agent, marketing person, whatever I am. So. It was a long journey. I'm not going to lie, but I've never felt better about where I am mentally and emotionally with all of that. That's awesome. And when I was going through your social media, I saw a comment when you posted villain, there was a mom who commented. I don't know if you've seen this comment or not, but she said that her one-year-old daughter was born deaf and had implants and that she was playing her music on the phone one day and it was it was villain that was playing it was your music and the girl grabbed the phone and was dancing around and sort of singing gibberish to it and so when you see things like that how how does that make you feel it's um i don't know if i saw that comment that's pretty phenomenal honestly it's that's the kind of stuff that warms your heart of it brings so much joy to people. You know, the song itself might not, but moments that the song creates can, which is really cool. And on the reciprocal side of that, you know, my song stronger than I am, or even villain, uh, people are really finding that three minutes that they listen to it extremely relatable. And it's helping them get through a breakup or a death or an argument with their boss or whatever it is. And um, that's the whole reason why. I continued with it since I was nine years old is to make people feel from something I've created, which is extremely special. And does it become difficult as you become busier? Because when you're starting out, you have all this time to spend focusing on your fans, I would imagine, because they're there, they're in front of you. 
but as get you get busier and now all that you have you're working on so much is it sort of a double edged sword that you're not able to focus on that fan side as much as you maybe would want to because there's so much work on the other side yeah you know i've oh my gosh i've never been busier than i am right now and i'm so thankful for it it's everything i've worked and prayed for and hoped for but um it's all about time management you know it's i I do my best to hit up the fans as much as I can. I'm excited. I'm now on cameo so I can really interact with them on a one-on-one -on -one level. But, um, you know, I also need to make sure I got time to call my mom and dad every week and <laughs> spend time with Dara and to exercise and all this stuff. So, um, I probably could respond more to comments and I'm going to do that. I'm going to set that goal. I'm going to set that goal right now that I'm going to do that more because I don't have as much time as I used to. And I do miss comments like that because there's just so many. That's another thing is I don't have the time, but now they've like they just multiplied by a hundred thousand. And it's just like, whoa, this is a lot. It's exactly. crazy. Exactly. Yeah. And so working on your new project, you were signed, you know, villain exploded. You signed to a record label and you were able to jump in the studio with Joey Moy. I wanted to talk to you about him. What has it been like working with him on your, your first music that you're putting out? Um, for you guys listening, you can't see, I'm just shaking my head and smiling because um, I never, I never in a million years would have really thought that I was going to be able to work with Joey Moy with all of his nickelback years heading into the barefoot blue jean night and cruise and all of these songs that made me fall in love with country music. And now all of the stuff he's doing with Hardy and Morgan and Chris Lane, it's just, he's so innovative. And now that I, I'm working with him, I listen to music differently than I did before because I hear how he creates it in the studio. I hear how he, speaks to the musicians the little things he says to tweak something to bring that magic out and also joey his girlfriend ashley dara and me are like four peas in a pod we are <laughs> drinking buddies we really get along so um it definitely brings an even cooler aspect that now we're we're friends more than just producer artist relationship you know and you talked about being in a little intimidated going into writer's rooms now because of who you're writing with. When you stepped into the studio with Joey for the first time, was it pretty intimidating? You know, it, it surprisingly wasn't. Um, I think because the first time we got in the studio was like March of 2021. And we had been hanging out and drinking for almost four months at that point between oh, okay. Big Loud being like, hey, come sign with us. And then me signing. And again, we're, we're very, very good friends. So, uh, no, it wasn't. And I think the first day in the studio that I was with him, we did overnight sensation and remind me of you. And I was pretty damn confident in those songs and, uh, confident what Joey could do. It's really just been cool watching the evolution of us trying to figure out what is the Lily Rose sound, you know, and we're finally there. We finally have 13 songs now that we're like, you know, I think we have like a collection. I think we have a, a thing now, you know, which is cool. Yeah, that must have been an interesting process in this ramping up so quickly is finding that sound for an entire record, a cohesive piece of work. Yeah, it, um, it definitely was kind of a cool challenge. Um, I'm glad that it all happened so bang, bang, bang quickly um, and not as much of like a development artist and record right. deal. Um, but it all kind of, stems from the songs just that we decided to cut um you know songs like know my way around and i don't smoke and every last one which is a song coming out tonight it comes out october 29th um all already had this sonic thing from the demo whether i was a writer or not but we kind of just chased that and it, it worked know my way around was really the one that shaped everything we've done after that though because we just saw a huge reaction from it and we were like, okay, we got to keep this whole hip hop beat with acoustic guitar, clever lyric up because it's working. Right. That's awesome. And I wanted to talk about Eddie's Attic in Atlanta. Hometown shows. Now you played there in 2019 before the pandemic hit. 
And then I believe you were able to play there recently in 2021. And so I wanted to ask you about the difference between those two shows <laughs> and what it was like. Yeah, you know, it's crazy. I've played Eddie's Attic every single year since 2016, oh, which really? is cool. Um, and we've only had one that we've not sold out, which is I'll take it. Like we <laughs> hometown, hometown folks show up. I actually was lucky enough to play um in 2020. It was in February, so it was before the pandemic hit. So oh, okay. even just the the year difference, like a true 12 month difference of both sold out. But one had a lot more excitement and buzz and uh, radio people there than the other <laughs> one did. Um, you know, Atlanta is my home and uh, the radio station started playing villain early before the ad date even. So there were radio people there. We did two shows that sold out. Everyone was just on the edge of their seat for new music. And um, it was the first time I, I could feel a hometown show of this is wild. And I think it's going to keep growing. Like we're, we're not graduating and just doing this every year where it, this is, it's about to get bigger kind of thing. That's awesome. And I wanted to ask you about happy ever after I saw a post from August, 2020 that you mentioned that was your favorite song that you had written in 2020. And so I wanted to ask about that song. And if we're going to hear that song. I love that song. My label also loves that song, um, which is a pretty rare thing. Like usually if we've got a heater in the folder, we want to put that out, but um, we're going to be patient on that song. Um, I think it's pretty spectacular. I think it's a potential moment to have. Yeah. Happy ever after is special. And I do not doubt that you guys will be seeing that song soon. That is amazing. And is it difficult for you with the amount of music that I imagine you have to sort of have a release schedule now and not just sort of be able to throw it out when you want to throw it out? It's definitely, uh, you know, this year is a year of learning and it's been a year of adjusting, you know? Um, I feel like I've adjusted pretty well because this has always been the dream and I'm not a selfish, I really am not a selfish person. When I took these label meetings, I said, as long as you guys treat me as a respect of an artist and a songwriter, I'll do the same as a marketing director, as a CEO, as a this. And I trust the hell out of them. So yeah, it's an adjustment of having to jump through a bunch of hoops to either get a yes or a no. And I don't really have control over it anymore, but um, it's, it's a dream come true and I wouldn't change a thing. That's great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Congratulations on oh everything that has happened over the past year and just what you've been able, able to accomplish and, and what the future is going to hold. Seriously, thank you so much. Like this was one of my favorite interviews I've ever done. This is, oh, that's I feel awesome. like I could talk thank to you. you. I feel like I could talk to you for another 30 minutes. So I appreciate it, Brendan. Thank you once again so much for listening. And thank you to Lily for stopping by and sharing her story. Be sure to check out her debut album, Stronger Than I Am, wherever you stream your music. Please also be sure to like, share, follow, subscribe to us wherever you are listening. You can leave us a review, a rating, tell your friends and family, your neighbors to come on over and have a listen. That support is huge. Thanks once again, and we'll see you next time on Country Music Made Me. Mm -hmm.